Great. Um, thank you again for that introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to share an idea that I've been thinking about for a few years now and hear your thoughts about it. Um, I study votive offering assemblages from sanctuaries in Roman, Britain, and Gaul, and I am especially enthusiastic about using these offering assemblages to study gender dynamics of colonialism in the provinces. And one reason I find offerings so valuable for this kind of research is because each offering represents a decision made by an individual, and by nature of the objects themselves, we can sometimes work out whether that individual was a man or a woman. The other reason is that because these objects are offerings, they're by nature symbolic, and because of that, they provide a valuable means to try to catch sight of the symbolic worldviews of the individuals who offered them. So this talk is about a single pattern in votive offerings that I found in my PhD research. And it's a pattern that surrounds the physical materials themselves of the offering, so clay, bone, and glass and metal, and the gendered associations that come with those materials. What I'd like to do today is to put that single pattern in a much broader context and use it to try to think about the gendered implications of Roman colonialism. So not just the ways men's and women's experiences differed under colonialism, but also the way worldviews around gender, so gender roles and gendered power and gender indifference were changed or shaped by living under Roman colonial rule. Uh, I like to uh, say that Roman colonialism has gender stuck in its core. And that's a pretty abstract idea, but there are also some pretty compelling ways that gendering rises to the surface of the material and textual record. So for example, I've put up um, on the slide here two pretty recognizable images of Roman imperial might where the provinces are personified and also feminized. So on the left, we have figures representing, uh, we think, uh, Hispania and Gallia um, on either side of Augustus's breastplate, and they're both sitting down and pacified. And on the right, we have this more shocking and violent image of Claudius conquering Britannia, who's actually this personified, feminized, sexualized image. Actually, uh, excuse me. Uh, actually, though, it's not just the Roman world where colonial dynamics are gendered in this way. Colonialism actually has a pretty troubling habit of getting gender stuck in its core, which is something that's been explored in the history and archaeology of the of modern European colonialism and also in indigenous studies in some really valuable ways in the last few decades. And we're right now at a really exciting time when it comes to centering gender in the study of Roman colonialism. So people have been studying women in the provinces and gender and identity in the provinces for a while, but just in the last few years, there's been some real excitement in developing conference sessions and even some new edited volumes on the topic. And what I'd like to do today is to take this general exploration of gender and Roman colonialism and develop my version of a structure around it. So a structure that first goes beyond gendered experiences of colonialism and into the gendered nature of imperial power dynamics themselves, which I'm doing with the help of discussions around gender and colonialism in more recent time periods. And then second, a structure around it that allows us to materialize this insight into the archaeological record. So we can try to see how people's understandings of gender may have changed as a result of colonialism. So just to keep me on track with my outline, um, first I want to develop that structure around gender and colonialism by looking at gender as something that's deeply rooted within colonial mindsets. I want to share what I really mean when I say that colonialism has gender stuck in its core. Um, even though it's not a perfect split, from an archeological perspective, it's useful to separate this conversation on gender and colonialism into two distinct veins. Uh, the first is uh, gender and lived experience of colonialism. And the second is the centrality of gendered worldviews to imperial power and colonial dynamics. And the vein that's a lot easier to materialize is that first one on gender and lived experience. So that's where the bulk of archeological engagement with this topic has been, both in modern European colonial contexts and in the Roman provinces. So I'll just 
briefly mention some of the work that's been done on this topic in the Roman Northwest, for example. So sort of the most basic task is adding women into our understandings of these regions. So considering women's roles and women's behavior. And actually in the introduction to their 2023 edited volume, uh, Cornwell and Wolf note that, the, that most of the studies in the volume focus on that critical corrective task of centering women's behavior for the first time in study of these spaces. Um, one especially powerful example of this has been proving the basic fact of uh, women's presence in Roman frontier forts. Um, other work has engaged with some specifics of gender differences and experiences co of colonialism. So work on, on the centrality of sexual violence in these periods of conquest or work on the dynamics of intermarriage and some fascinating work on men's versus women's dress on tombstones in the provinces, um, showing how markers of Roman or indigenous ethnicity were mobilized to signal a family's positioning between cultures. The, the second vein of this study is really, it's critically important, but it's so far played less of a role in the archeological study of gender and colonialism because it is harder to materialize. So to, to dig into this vein, I'm borrowing from some, some fascinating work in the last couple of decades in the field of history and in indigenous feminist and queer theory, linking our modern era of settler colonialism to heteropatriarchy. Um, Taking and, and maintaining control means seeing those you're, you're seeking to conquer as just utterly other, you know, less than, and then making that otherness seem natural. And for a patriarchal or a heteropatriarchal society, gender is absolutely critical in this. You know, us versus them gets mapped onto another binary, which is gender. And I want to be clear, we don't have to understand gender as binary in our own lives or our own society to understand its value as such to these colonial societies. And the reason gender is so critical to this othering, this us and them, is that in a hetero in a heteropatriarchy, gender relations are also power relations. And because gender was so natural, so ingrained, so fundamental, those power relations were too. Uh, these us and them gender binaries are also racialized in colonial context. So indigeneity itself becomes feminized and queered and part of the imperial project becomes imposing order through requiring sex and gender, gender categories and family dynamics and kinship structures to be legible within the heteropatriarchal system. We can see this Roman heteropatriarchal imperial worldview pretty clearly through text and imagery through these themes that people also discuss about around modern European colonialism. So Romans feminized conquered peoples, both in the general sense, so like personifying provinces as these submissive women and in more specific descriptions of foreign people. So men as having long hair, men as wearing jewelry, men as being unable to control their emotions. Um, Romans describe British and Gallic men fighting alongside women or even, God forbid, being willing to be led into battle by women. Um, there are also deep connections between conquest and sexual violence through this theme of autonomy or sovereignty. If you're, if you're justifying the taking of land, something that can go along with that is, is justifying the violating of someone's bodily autonomy too. And we see this in the Roman world, for example, in imagery where the emperor is dominating a personification of conquered land. And then, you know, rape also plays a role in Roman narratives of conquest, like uh, the like the story of the Boudican revolt in Britain, which was ostensibly spurred by Roman soldiers' rape of Boudicca's daughters. And there, okay, there's a lot to unpack here in this last one, but but Roman masculinity itself was linked to this understanding of sexuality as conquering. You know, to be a man, in a real set, in a real sense, meant to be the active participant in sexual penetration, and that helps explain the value to Roman writers in characterizing Celtic-speaking men as habitually having sex with other men, or you know, being satisfied to be the the second or even. Um, the 12th husband in a polyandrous marriage, which is something that Caesar says about the Britons in his Gallic Wars. My question is then, what impact did this centrality of gender and gendered power to Roman imperial ideology have on the way individuals in the provinces 
thought about gender and their gendered place in the world. This is something that we can't really glean through texts. And don't get me wrong, it's not easy to access materially either, but that's our that's our better chance, especially because we need to be able to compare what these worldviews looked like in the Roman period to the pre-Roman Iron Age when we don't have texts written from that emic perspective anyway. And this is especially important in this region uh, in that Romans were coming into contact with people who thought about gender differently. Uh, it's not like written or archeological sources suggest some sort of like gender egalitarian utopia um, in Britain and Gaul in the Iron Age, but the evidence does suggest more flexibility in gender roles and also the ability for women to hold high status in their own right. So gendered understandings of the world in Britain and Gaul pre-conquest must have been different from what it was in Rome. So then what happened when these different understandings of the world came into contact in a context of colonial domination? In his chapter in uh, Cornwall and Wolf's 2023 edited volume, Richard Alston characterizes gender as a, quote, deep structure within society closely associated with the everyday structuring of power, unquote. I'm really drawn to this phrasing of deep structure. And by engaging with these issues of gender and worldviews and imperial ideology, I am engaging with gender as deep structure in Roman colonialism specifically. To engage materially with the impacts of this deep structure, I'm turning to anthropological literature on symbolic systems. Um, so the purpose of a symbolic system is to structure just the chaos of everything happening in the world into something that humans can find meaning in and find order in. So a symbolic system is a culture's internally coherent, symbolic way of organizing and categorizing the world. Ortner develops this idea of key symbols at the heart of a culture's worldview, and within her typology of key symbols, I find the most value in this case in the type that she calls the, the root metaphor, because it's what she calls elaborating instead of what she calls um, um, summarizing. So it's elaborating because it acts as like a font from which other symbolic connections and categories just flow. And my argument is that we can think of gender as deep structure and colonialism as based in a root metaphor in the Roman world. That's the, the relationship between men and women. Um, and in a, in, a, in a root metaphor that's defined by a relationship like that, the concept of man and woman are in, in binary opposition, but the interaction between them is what it's, it's what's critically shaping the way the world is organized. So implicated within this relationship based root metaphor are gender roles and gender dynamics and sexual dynamics and the sexed body. And in fact, the human body within symbolic anthropological thought is a really common basis of a lot of powerful metaphors through which the world is categorized. So the body's symmetry and balance can act as a root metaphor and so can divisions between inside and outside. Um, bodily fluids hold a lot of symbolic power and the danger in not being able to control what goes into and comes out of the body can be broadened out to understand the dangerous nature of community boundaries. Um, and beyond the human body itself, sexuality as metaphor can organize understandings of um, penetrability and boundedness and controllability in terms of an individual's relation to society that go beyond sex itself. And then because I'm defining this root metaphor more broadly as the, the relationship between men and women, broader issues of power dynamics are implicated too. So gender roles and gender dynamics become connected to the state ideology of domination and control. So emperor is to subjects as man is to his family. This really structural symbolism that I'm pursuing through this root metaphor approach has been out of vogue in archeology span for at least a couple of decades, but I'm, I'm certainly not alone in applying something like root metaphor to the archaeological record. That said, most recent symbolic approaches to the to gender to the archaeological record pursue a, a less structuralist, less like all-encompassing version. But even so, work on gendered symbolism in archaeology is really exciting. So this work looks at, for example, 
clay pots as these vessels that are symbolically connected with femininity in the Americas or megaliths as these lasting and imposing features that are connected with masculinity in Africa. The reason that I'm drawn to the more structuralist root metaphor approach is that just as we might think of a root metaphor as a, as a, a font of categories from an emic perspective, it also becomes a rich source of hypotheses from our perspective as researchers. So how might we expect to see this root metaphor emerge in different ways of categorizing the material record? And that brings me finally all the way back to votive offerings and it, specifically the materials that they were made out of. Uh, archaeologists, including archaeologists of the Roman world, have certainly engaged with the symbolism of raw materials. So in the Roman world, one example that I think is especially cool and creative is the argument that lead was such a powerful material for cursing because lead itself was cold and heavy and gray like a dead body. So these are ways in which the physical properties of a material take on symbolic importance. We have a little bit of evidence for some materials being symbolically gendered in the Roman world, like the idea that amber and jet were associated with women. If the Roman gendered root metaphor provided a means to categorize materials like it did people, you know, creating a distinction between materials associated with maleness and materials associated with femaleness, the easiest hypothesis that I can come up with is that this distinction falls along lines of something like durability and strength, um, that tough materials like metal would be associated with men and softer or more breakable materials would be associated with women. So I'll go ahead and, and spoil the ending for you to tell you that that's in fact exactly what I find, um, but the, the details of my findings allow me to nuance this a little bit. So I think it's not exactly about strength and weakness, but something more like impermeability or impenetrability and permeability. Um, but before we get into those details, I'd like to, to walk you through my data set. So the first question is, what can votive offerings look like in Roman Britain and Gaul? My data set has a lot of diversity, so it includes purpose-made votives like altars and plaques and figurines, but also personal objects, um, jewelry, toiletry items, gaming pieces, weapons, tools, and on and on and on. Actually, this diversity of offering types in the Roman period suggests that we really are generally seeing individuals making decisions instead of some sort of top-down directive from priests. The diversity also seems to speak to the wide range of folks who left the offerings. So women left offerings alongside men, and folks were leaving cheap trinkets and broken tools and even manufacturing waste alongside expensive statues or inscribed altars. The offering assemblage that I'm analyzing here includes about 2,500 individual objects offered at five sanctuaries in Britain and five in Gaul. And almost all of the data comes from cataloged catalogs of finds published with insight reports, but a, but a limited amount comes from unpublished museum inventories. And in terms of chronology, I'm interested in the way living under Roman rule impacted this fundamental question of individual's gender worldview. Um, that's why I'm not studying the immediate post-contact period um, or the, the post-conquest period, because I'm, I'm, I'm only, I, I'm, I wanna see what's happening once this stuff is like a little bit more set. So I'm only including offerings left at least 50 or 100 years after official annexation. So by that time, I expect that nobody has strong personal memories of life before Roman rule, and that at least a generation or two has grown up under Roman rule. Part of my analysis relies on assigning genders to individual offerings. Uh, so deciding whether a man or a woman was more likely to have left that offering type. So I'll go through just a bit of how I do that because it's not always straightforward. It's easy to gender objects that are inscribed with an offerer's name, but there's more uncertainty around any other object type. And in, in projects in the past, Lindsay Allison Jones and Penelope Allison have warned that it's misleading to treat most designations as certain. You know, even when we have a sense from multiple lines of evidence that some types of objects were generally associated with men or generally associated with women, 
People are complicated. Objects have multiple purposes. Exceptions exist to every rule. So as I'm gendering objects, I'm using textual evidence and imagery and archaeological evidence, generally from sex burials, but I'm employing a certainty scale so that I can test hypotheses using objects that are gendered at different levels of certainty. So only objects inscribed with names are securely gendered, uh, and all other objects are either likely or possibly gendered. And in this case, for this particular analysis I'm talking about here, the level of certainty that I include or exclude doesn't change the conclusions. The, the numbers change a bit, but the patterns themselves don't shift. All right, so on to the main event. How am I studying associations between offering material and gender? Um, I'm doing it in two ways which I'm, I'm separating into offered by and representation of. Uh, so first, do men and women, men's and women's offerings trend towards certain materials? And this is the part that relies on my object gender designations. And then second, are men and women or gods and goddesses visually represented at different rates in different materials? So this is a question that's about the figures represented on some offerings, regardless of who offered them. So let's start with the first way, the, the materials of gendered offerings. So you'll see that in this table, I contextualize the data by including the proportion of offerings of the material that can't be assigned one gender or another. Uh, gendered bone offerings clearly skew towards women, and even if every ungendered bone object was offered by a man, which is unlikely anyway, there wouldn't be enough of them to balance out the number offered by women. Most glass offerings were women's objects also, even with the ungendered objects included, though the extent to which this is skewed to, to one type of object, which is glass beads, needs some unpacking, which I'll, I'll do in a minute. So bone and glass then were more connected to women's offering practice than men's. Men and women offered relatively similar proportions of ceramic and stone offerings, and the gendered offerings are outnumbered by the ungendered offerings of these types um, anyway. Men's metal offerings outnumber women's. Uh, but it's important to note that ungendered metal offerings are much more common than the gendered ones anyway. The other way to study this question is through visual representations of men and women in different materials, which I'd actually argue actually provides the more direct way of looking at symbolic connections between gender and material. So in this case, I'm not looking at who owned or chose these objects, but instead, in the worldview of offers, who was more appropriate to be represented in which materials. So I'll go through each of these individually and contextualize them alongside the first set of data, the, the offered by data. Though I'll actually start with the one type where we don't have any examples of human figures, which is glass. So the glass objects are, are really, they're really dominated by beads, um, but there are also some other objects and the most common other type of objects is glass hairpins. And by nature, those objects, so beads and hairpins are tied to women's behavior and not men's, which makes me most hesitant within my study about the gendered associations with glass because it has so much to do with the types of objects themselves. That said, if glass objects were more part of the daily lives of women than men, it, it could be the case that this material took on gendered connotations as a result of that, which actually speaks to an interesting sort of chicken and egg challenge here. You know, do gendered material categories come from the physical properties of the materials themselves or the context or who used those materials or some sort of way that the, the two were, were building on each other? Bone was both skewed towards women in offered by and representations of. There are only four human representations in bone, uh, which limits the interpretive weight of that accord. But it is interesting that all four bone gendered representations were of women, given that gendered bone objects were also so skewed towards women. <laughs> 
And it's especially enticing when we consider it alongside the metal evidence. So the skew towards men in metal representations seems to lend significance to the skew towards men in the gendered offerings, which we needed given the really high proportion of ungendered metal offerings. And this maleness of metal feels even more meaningful given that data set wide, both gendered offerings and gendered representations actually skew towards women. So women make up over 50% of gendered offerings and something like 78% uh, uh, of gendered representations. It's also worth mentioning here that when I conducted a separate project in the past that was studying Gallo-Roman healing votives, which are by nature shaped like human bodies or body parts. So that's a different data set, but I actually found the same skew towards men in metal offerings in that data set too. So that was an exciting accord for me. Clay objects weren't offered more often by men or by women, but clay representations clearly favor women. And this is because of clay figurines of goddesses. Um, you know, other researchers, researchers have already noted the skew towards goddesses over gods and clay figurines. And the most common types are Venuses and mother goddesses. Stone is the category that gives me the most trouble because stone objects are pretty, are split pretty evenly between men and women by both measures. And actually there's overlap here because a significant number of stone offerings were healing votives, which were shaped like the bodies of the people who left them. So they're both representations of and offered by simultaneously. But anyway, I've got a few ideas here on why th this is so even. You know, it could be that stone as a material wasn't gendered or was dual gendered, um, given the extent to which men and women are both represented in stone statues and gravestones in the Roman world, that could certainly be the case. My other suspicion is that symbolically, the even split could be the result of, of gendered symbolism specific to different types of stone, which isn't something that's reported on in enough detail in finds catalogs for me to test. So it could have something to do, for example, with like the colors of the stone or the hardnesses of the stone, or given my interest in permeability, it could you know, be about the porousness of different types of stone. So what made metal more appropriate for depictions of men and clay more appropriate for depictions of women? And what made women offer objects of bone and glass more often than men? I started this study with a bit of a hypothesis that I might find differences in gendered associations with materials where it comes to something like durability versus breakability. And that's actually the conclusion um, Matthew Fittick comes to in his excellent PhD thesis on figurines in Roman Britain. And he wasn't looking at sanctuary sites in particular, but my findings mirror his in that he found that clay figurines are skewed towards goddesses and women and children, and bronze figurines are skewed towards gods and men. And he suggests that metal is more appropriate for men and gods because of its strength and durability. And then women and children and goddesses are formed out of more breakable clay in symbolic association with something like the fragility of life and uncertainties surrounding fertility. And I agree with this on a general level, but in connecting this to the gendered Roman root metaphor, I think we get, uh, get some more insight too. Uh, in that root metaphor, around this relationship between men and women, the Roman worldview includes this idea of masculinity as impenetrability or impermeability, both physically and with respect to the flow of power. So the strongest men gave orders and didn't receive them. And this was in contrast to the penetrability or permeability of femininity, which sure could be about sex itself, but also about other ways in which the physical or the symbolic boundaries of a body were crossed. And this is connected to, you know, the dangers of childbirth and the ideal that women's behavior be controlled by men. So it's easy to see through this symbolic system how the fragility of a ceramic object, you know, the ability to shatter it accidentally or with the right force applied could become associated with femininity or the female body. And it seems to me that glass would hold a similar place in terms of breakability. And it may be that the translucence of glass added to that permeability. You know, light could shine through some glass objects. 
bone isn't as breakable as clay or glass, but it's certainly not as durable as metal is. And it's also porous and actually clay is too. You know, if they're, if they're submerged, they'll take on moisture, unlike metal. Because, and because this is the pattern that I found at sanctuaries in Britain and Gaul, it seems to suggest that in this way, we can see an uptake of this Roman symbolic system that the people making the offerings did so within a worldview that femininity was associated with permeability in contrast to masculine impermeability. It's, it's worth considering here as a counter argument that what we're really seeing is something more like gendered access to wealth than gendered symbolic system. So is it, for example, that the metal objects were more expensive and men were the ones who had access to the money to buy them. So one response here is that, you know, an important part of my analysis is looking not at who was purchasing these objects, but who was represented in those materials. Um, my other response is that the actual types of metal objects offered by men often don't connote any, any real level of wealth. Actually, more than I think something like 53%, um, more than half of men's off metal offerings were tools or manufacturing waste, like drips from the casting process. And so men may certainly have offered metal because of its symbolic value as a material, but men of lower economic status clearly had access to metal to offer. And I actually I find a little more support for this again through my previous data set and previous project on healing votives. So metal offerings in that, in that project were skewed towards men. And most of them were in the form of these, these small, relatively inexpensive cut bronze sheets. So this is probably about three or four centimeters tall. So altogether, choice of offering material seems to have been connected more closely to the symbolic value than to the, than to the economic value. So by 50 or 100 years post-conquest, we see evidence that in this material respect, people's behavior did reflect the, the symbolic system of Rome. That has to be contextualized by looking at symbolism surrounding materials and permeability and impermeability and gender in the Iron Age in these regions. So how much change really occurred due to Roman influence? You know, did this gendered symbolism exist in Celtic speaking worldviews pre-conquest. We don't have texts to help us here. So it's, uh, so it's a really challenging question to answer. Uh, from burial evidence in Iron Age Britain, we see that glass beads were female objects and we see that ceramics were found pretty commonly in both male and female graves, which is uh, reflects what I found in my, uh, um, in my offerings. But the, the limitation to burial context here is interpretively problematic when I'm comparing them to votive offerings. And then the stronger evidence for these symbolic associations in my study is in gendered representations. Uh, but we have so few human figures at all in Iron Age art, so that makes it challenging. Actually, one of the best points of evidence I've come up with so far is that in the pre-Roman worldview in this region, springs and rivers tend to be associated with female deities or spirits. This isn't an absolute rule, but evidence suggests that for the most part, these uncontrollably flowing sources of water were associated with femininity. And then largely because of the ritual deposition of objects, some really, some objects connoting like a lot of power, like swords and craters and that sort of thing. Scholars argue that these were symbolically liminal spaces, you know, marking the boundary between our world and a, and a spirit world, another spirit world. Through the structuralist, the, through the root metaphor perspective, I am positing that we can connect the uncontrolled water of rivers and springs to liminality and permeability and femininity through symbolism of the human body. So in her book, Purity and Danger, Mary Douglas metaphorically connects the human body to the, to the larger community through this idea of safety inside and danger outside. So she says, quote, the symbolism of the body's boundaries is used to express danger to community boundaries, unquote. And there's a lot of scholarship in this symbolic vein, and through it, we get an understanding that bodily orifices or wounds 
represent dangerous liminal spaces because bodily fluids can escape and foreign substances can enter. And both can be polluting, right? There's danger when we can't keep the inside in and the outside out. And Elizabeth Gross connects this danger to a gender notion of masculine impermeability and feminine permeability. So not only does masculinity mean not letting anything from the outside into the body, but it also means being able to control what's released from the body. So femininity is defined in contrast through uncontrolled flows from the body in terms of things like menstruation. So, okay, given the Iron Age association of rivers and springs with femininity, I would suggest that the worldview among Celtic speaking peoples did include an understanding of femininity around uncontrolled flow through liminal spaces, but I think we'd be hard pressed to see these flows as, as polluting or negatively connoted given how powerfully sacred these spaces were. You know, these were spaces where people were making a lot of really powerful offerings. So there then is my best evidence so far for femininity as permeability in the Iron Age. So to the extent that that metaphor shaped Iron Age worldviews, the permeability of femininity was, I think, loaded differently than it was in the Roman world. So maybe still dangerous, but dangerous in its, dangerous in its power and requiring reverence rather than dangerous in its pollution and inferior in its inability to control itself. I've got one other possible way of engaging with this idea of permeability in the Iron Age, but I hesitate here because the line of evidence is itself so biased. I'm talking here about classical authors' depictions of male sexuality in Britain and Gaul. So for example, we have Diodorus Siculus saying that men commonly had sex with other men. And he even says that it was so common as to be an act of respect or hospitality. And we can't know the extent of exaggeration here, but if there is a grain of truth, it would certainly seem to be evidence that in this worldview, we could hardly define masculinity as, you know, like impenetrability. So I said earlier that I haven't found many good ways to engage with the gender associations of different materials in the Iron Age, but I want to talk a bit about metal because metal plays an especially important role in our understanding of the time period. So is there evidence for metal in its durability and in its impermeability as symbolically male before the Roman period? It's definitely true that metal weapons that could puncture or penetrate had ritual significance given the sacrifice and hoarding of weapons. Given that weapons are generally found in male graves in the Iron Age, weapons can be associated with masculinity. But it's important to know specifically with high status masculinity instead of masculinity in general. So poorer males tend to not have weapons in their graves. That said, other metal goods associated with high status, so especially torques, so neck rings and, and feasting objects like craters are found in both male and female high status graves, which suggests to me that in the Iron Age, metal as a material was associated primarily with status instead of gender. Then by 50 or 100 years post-conquest, we see evidence of an understanding of metal as masculine, and this masculinity wasn't linked to high-status men. As I, okay, as I wrap up here, this is, this is clearly one small study, and I don't mean for this to be definitive in any sense, but in this one small study, the evidence points to the uptake in the centuries post-conquest of this Roman fundamental binary opposition that defined masculinity as impermeability and defined femininity in contrast. Through the best evidence I can find, if femininity as permeability existed in the Iron Age, it was loaded differently, you know, not with the same sort of inferiority. My bigger goal here is that beyond just this interesting small case study, this gives a bit of a roadmap to engage with this broader topic of gender and Roman colonialism through this different and really challenging thread of gender and worldviews. Um, to me, what's valuable about this group metaphor approach is that it's, it's, it's really generative in helping us as researchers 
think of unexpected places to look for gender in the archaeological record. So I'll be very happy to answer questions. And I'd also really love to hear your thoughts, either, either now or I'll, I'll try not to put you on the spot. So I've, I've shared my email address again. But especially, you know, I've been thinking about other aspects of the physical nature of these materials that may be connected with gender. So in terms of the source of the raw materials or the processing of those into the final form. So if anybody has thoughts on other symbolic elements of these materials or other materials that can be placed within this symbolic view, I'd re be really interested to hear about that. Um, as you saw, I'm very much in the market for other places to look in the Iron Age archeological record for material symbolism and symbolism around permeability and impermeability. I'd also love to hear what else this sort of fundamental Roman gendered root metaphor might spark that may go outside of permeability or outside of physical materials. And frankly, I'd also love to hear if you'd frame a Roman root metaphor in a different way than I am, even if it's not a gendered way. So with those shameless requests for help or, and ideas, I'll, I'll go ahead and conclude now. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having some time to chat. Thank you very much.